this is great. Nobody wants to solve it. Oh, yeah. That's what most people get. But, oh, we're just about to start. Oh, good. Fantastic. Well, we'll catch up again later. It'd be great. All right. Um, so, should we stand for this or what should we do? Uh, I have someone into coming to introduce me, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I'm not sure where that's going to happen. So, perhaps I'll introduce myself. <laughs> Are we live on Zoom right now? We're just about to go live. Perfect. I'm going to tuck this away. Oh, here we go. Hello. Yes, let's do that. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to World Vancouver and to the presentation on the business of screenwriting. Can you imagine that you actually make money on it? Okay. <laughs> the, the, pre the presentation is sponsored by the BC branch of the Canadian Authors Association, CAA. Um, we provide programs, services, and resources to people who write and who want to write. Our motto is writers helping writers. We have a table upstairs. Please get some more information. Canadian Authors Association. Our distinguished presenter, welcome. Thank you. Is Kat, Mo Kat Montague, um, head of department for the Vancouver Film School, where she has taught screenwriting for over 20 years. Her classes have heard countless to work on theories, on series, and on video games. She has been named Instructor of the Year at the Film School three times. Pat is also the author of the best selling book, The Dreaded Curse Screenplay Formatting for Film and Television, which is used in film schools and universities across the country. Kat loves the apartment, yes. She loves Ted Lasso, and she loves the legend of Zelda. And currently, she is also writing one-hour drama series pilots. Kat, welcome. Thank you very Thank much. You. I really appreciate that. Hello, everyone. So we're going to talk about the business of screenwriting. Um, this is something I find very uh, sort of personally invested in. Um, I went to do an undergrad, deg undergrad degree in creative writing, and then later on I did a master's degree in creative writing, and no one ever talked about money. Uh, no one talked about how much you can make, how to get a job, uh, how to build a career, any of the things that really matter to writers. We don't want to be hobbyists. We want to be working writers. That's my goal, uh, and as a teacher, that's something that I've developed in all of the courses that I've built. Uh, and now as the head of a department, it's a really important focus for me in bringing in guest speakers and in introducing my grads to agents and trying to help people take those next steps that they need to take in order to get the first writing job. So this is a lot of what I'm going to be talking about. I also want to answer some sort of frequently asked questions about the business side of screenwriting. There are lots of wonderful books about learning how to become a better writer for screenplay. Um, you know, you could read Dave, Dave Churchill's Screenwriting Bible. Uh, you could read Linda Seeger's Making a Good Script Great. There are lots of wonderful books about how to be a better writer. That is not what I'm teaching you today. What I want to teach you today is how to make a living as a writer, how to get started. So uh, let's, let's get going with this. Now, you'll see some images in this, uh, in this PowerPoint presentation. The images are all of films, television shows, and video games that were written by people who were my students at one time. So they're kind of, I hope, a little bit inspirational. Uh, I think uh, kind of maybe surprising uh, that so many people who come from this city um, are doing projects that are appreciated all over the world. So I kind of want to show that too. Um, so one of the first things screenwriters want to know is when they can join the Writers Guild. I think there's sort of a misunderstanding about the Writers Guild that you can voluntarily join. It's not really like that. It's more like the mob. They make you join <laughs> when you're at a certain level. So when you're offered a contract by a signatory producer or a signatory studio, you have to join the Guild. So you could write. Lifetime movies, Hallmark movies, without joining because they're non-guild. But as soon as you're writing, let's say, on a TV series, you would have to join. Um, so that's sort of the way that that works. Uh, you may have heard about the current strike. Um, you know, it's kind of very interesting to me because the Writers Guild of Canada does the same things that the Writers Guild of America does. They lobby for the rights of writers. They negotiate agreements with the Directors Guild. Right now in America, they're negotiating with AMPTP. And AMPTP stands for all of the studios and all of the networks. So they basically given this organization carte blanche to negotiate on their behalf, and unfortunately, they're doing a terrible job. 
um, because they keep not coming back to the table. Uh, so it's really at a standstill and people are blaming the writers, but it's really the, uh, the alliance of producers that is not coming back to the table. So what do they do? Uh, they also help writers protect their work by registering it. If you want to succeed as a writer, you have to show people your work. You have to. It's just, you know, otherwise you're not going to make it. So ideally, you would register it first. There's two different ways of doing this. You can register it with the Writers Guild. Uh, you can go east or west. Um, it's pretty cheap. That $25 or $20, depending on where you do it, will last for five years. Um, now, five years, if you're young, you know, it seems like forever. If you're my age, it, it really goes by in a snap. So I, I'm going to suggest there is a better, more affordable, uh, long-term way of registering your script. And if we could go on um, a little bit later, we'll get to copyright, which is actually a more sensible idea because it lasts for decades after your death um, and it doesn't cost that much more. So, you know, they're both fine, whichever one you want to do. But before you start entering competitions, before you start sending your work out to producers, you should register it. And that way, if you find yourself in a lawsuit, you have evidence that you wrote a script. So we'll get back to that later. Actually, can we go back a little bit? Just one. Uh, there we go. Um, so they also provide industry standard record, uh, writing contracts. This is really helpful. Um, they're only really relevant, though, if you're a Writers Guild member. So they do give you an idea of what a contract should look like, but you have to be a member for those to be usable. If you're not, there's a really good book of contracts by Mark Litwack called uh, Contracts for Film and Television. So if someone offers you a writer's contract, do look in that book. You can get it at the library and just check that they have given you, you know, the right kind of clauses that should be there. Um, they collect script fees and royalties for you. So if a producer is not paying you, the Writers Guild will go knock in uh, and say, come on, hand over that money so we can give it to the writer. And that means you get that, that leverage, which is good, because there are producers who will try not to pay writers. They want to put every cent on screen, they say, and that means not paying us. Uh, so it's really good to have that kind of enforcement behind you. Um, an agent, by the way, will do the same thing. An agent will collect money on your behalf and then give it to you. Uh, so that, that is another way that you can get leverage in terms of getting paid. They also resolve disputes over working conditions and credits. This is really helpful. So let's say um, you know, your director tries to take your writing credit because they want to be seen as an auteur uh, and you think that's unfair. If you're a writer's guild member, they will arbitrate that without you needing to hire a lawyer. So that's a very useful thing. I had a friend who had that happen to him. Um, the Writers Guild organized an arbitration panel. They looked at all the versions of the screenplay. They decided that my friend deserved the writing credit, the sole writing credit, and they forced the director to take his name off, um, which was really wonderful. And it didn't cost my friend a cent, um, just his Writers Guild fees. So, you know, that's a very useful thing to know. Um, I think the world of the Writers Guild, I, I am not a member of the Writers Guild of Canada. I'm a member of the Writers Guild of Great Britain, um, because obviously you can tell I'm British. Um, they are sister organizations, Writers Guild of Great Britain, Writers Guild of Canada, Writers Guild of America. Um, so what that means is I would never take the work of, a, of an American writer, but I'm currently not on strike. So there we are. Um, so there's lots of Writers Guilds and they're all affiliates. So no matter which country you're in or where you're from, you can join a different one and you still have the benefits of being in one of the sister organizations. It also means, for example, if I were to move to Hollywood tomorrow, um, I would not have to pay the initiation fees because I've already paid the British ones. Uh, which are much lower. So that's good. Come, come on in. Yeah, this is the business of screenwriting. No worries. Um, so yeah, if we could go on. Um, now, copyright, I mentioned earlier, the right to copy. It does occur immediately as soon as you write something. So Canada and the UK have the standpoint that it, it occurs. Therefore, why bother registering it? That's all very well until you want to take someone to court and you need evidence. So personally, I think registering copyright is a good idea. Um, so either the Copyright Office, uh, which is relatively cheap, um, or with the Writers Guild. Can you go to the next one? It's important because you need to pitch your show to anyone who will listen. You might go to marketplaces like Banff or Content London or Series Mania or something like that. And you might pitch a television series and someone might think, oh, that's a good idea. Let's, let's just do that and cut out the middleman and hire someone we know to write that. But if you've registered it, you can prove uh, that you wrote that first. And if someone does go, try and go forward with something you know, very similar to what you've done or identical to what you've done, um, you have evidence. So that's a really useful thing. It means you can relax. It's like having a burglar alarm sticker on your car. You know, it's just a useful thing. It makes people avoid uh, messing with you. 
So that registration of a claim is $45 US. I'm going to strongly recommend you use the American system to register your screenplay with the Copyright Office because the Canadian system will take your $50 and they will take the name of the script and your name, but not the script itself. So they don't keep a copy of it. Uh, I asked them when, when we, I went through this with them, what good is that to me? What happens if somebody steals you know, my screenplay and changes the name? How will I be able to prove that I wrote this? And they could not give me a satisfactory answer. So I'm going to recommend very strongly you go with the American system. They are much more concerned with um, you know, litigious writers and, and producers. So it's a better place to do it. In the UK, you can't register with the Copyright Office, not something like this. Um, so uh, they keep your script on record indefinitely. So if you write a skill it, it's five years. If you Copyright Office, it's, it's going to last the rest of your life. And then between 50 and 70 years after your death. So if you were to write the next Star Wars, for example, um, your great grandchildren could be benefiting from that in your estate, which is good, that better. Uh, okay, let's go on. Uh, yeah, this is me with my warning about the Canadian Copyright Office. I was very annoyed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the things protected by copyright, songs, novels, plays or screenplays, magazine articles, computer programs, they're all protected by copyright. Uh, and again, it's always good to have some evidence of that if you, if you can. And then the next page is going to tell you what is not protected. Titles, ideas, the method of staging a play, a work in the public domain. I myself have written a Jane Austen uh, variation. Some of you may know that there's a big market for Jane Austen variations. I cannot copyright that because it is based on characters in the public domain. Um, so, you know, uh, that's it. You can't do it. Um, the facts in an article or the name of the program, unless it's, you're trademarking it. So it's really good to be aware of this. Um, you know, if you have a very high concept idea with like a fantastic title, uh, maybe hold off on, on, on pitching it in a, in a bar while you're, you've had too much to drink. <laughs> uh, you know, pitch it to someone who could actually go somewhere with that. Uh, all right, so let's move on. Uh, yeah, you could choose one or both. Um, but it's always good to do this before you start entering competitions. Every competition has a jury and you don't know who they are. And you really want to make sure that your work is protected before you start letting random people read it. I do believe in competitions. I think they're excellent for the careers of writers. They can put your head above the parapet so that people see you um, and they know how good you are and it opens doors. So I, I say yes to competitions. Uh, Movie Bites is my favorite website for finding good screenwriting competitions. So Movie Bites, and that's B-Y-T-E-S. I think I maybe have it on a slide later on. Um, the other way to get work is agents. Uh, and actually, a good screenwriting competition can open the door for an agent as well. Um, sometimes if you win or place in a competition, they will call you, uh, which is a very nice thing. Most of the time, feature film writers don't have agents in Canada. They don't really need them. You can call a producer and say, please, will you read my screenplay? And if they're feature film producers, they will often say yes. Uh, you can sometimes get, especially even at TV movies, you can get people to read your TV movie. Um, but television, you have to have an agent uh, because you won't find out about television shows staffing up until it's too late. So if you want to work in television, you want to write television episodes, you have to have an agent. So let's go on. Um, so how, are you, how do you get an agent? The best way is through a writer friend who is repped by them. Uh, I got my current agent and manager because I had partnered up with another writer to write a TV pilot, and she was repped by these two uh, agents and a manager in Toronto, and then they approached me and said, would you, would you like us to rep you as well? And I said, yeah, that'd be fantastic, because at that time I was unrepresented. In my career, I've been represented and not represented. I've done both. I understand how both of those things work. I would rather have representation, even though you're giving away a percentage of any money that you make, uh, because it gets you into the right doors at a higher level. Myself, I'm a good talker. I can get people to read my script at the development level, but my manager can get people to read my script at the producer level and much higher. So he got one of our TV pilots into Amblin Entertainment, which is Steven Spielberg. Left Bank read one of our pilots. I could never get in those doors on my own. Uh, so it's really worth thinking about uh, getting an agent if you really are ambitious for sort of higher level, bigger budget, or television, series television. Um, sorry, can you go back one more? Sorry. Um, a prestigious program like Pacific Screenwriting Program or Canadian Film Center, I'll talk about them a little bit later, they will introduce you to agents. Um, so it, if, for those of you interested in television, that might be a good way in. 
uh, in person at a social function. Events like this sometimes have agents come in and talk. You can chat to them after and then follow up later. And worst comes to worst, a query email followed up with a phone call. You know, it sometimes works. So it's, it is worth reaching out. Um, just make sure, if you go to the next one now, um, that if you do reach out to them, that you have enough samples. I'll talk about that how much in a minute. So this is how much they charge. Uh, sorry, just back a bit. Um, that 10% is in Canada. Uh, go back one, please. Um, and there we go. Going back. There we go. Um, so in Canada, it's currently 10%, although some people are starting to rise to 15. The ones who rise to 15 are generally doing both jobs, manager and agent. Generally, what an agent does is negotiate contracts for you. If they help you find a job, that's bonus. Um, a manager thinks about your career long term, and they help you plan. What's my career going to look like? How am I going to get where I want to be? So, you know, a really good Canadian agent does both. Um, but in Los Angeles, they tend to be split. You tend to have an agent and a manager. Sometimes you would be paying 15 to 25% for that. Uh, so, you know, I know that seems like a lot, but if you're not getting any work, that's zero. So, you know, if your agent and manager help you get work and help you negotiate a better contract, then they take 25%. Well, that's not bad. It's worth doing. Um, so, uh, other forms of representation. Let's say someone says to you, oh, yes, I would like to read your script. Get your agent to send it to me. What are you going to do if you don't have an agent? There's a couple of things you can do. Um, you can get an entertainment lawyer to send it. They will charge you up front, and they will also look at your contracts for you, um, but they will, again, they will charge you up front, and they charge a lot. $350 to $500 an hour uh, is what they charge. Um, but if you can find a friendly entertainment lawyer, and they do exist, um, you convince them that you are you know, on the, on, the, on the up and up, you're coming, you're an up and comer, uh, they will sometimes give you a deal. And it can be a really good thing to have that. I've been in that position myself. I had a 28 page contract from the CBC. Uh, I was not capable of making sure that it was you know, something I wanted to sign. Um, so I hired an, an entertainment lawyer to help me with that. He charged me 250 bucks to read a 28 page contract, which is very nice. I now feel like I owe him my firstborn, but <laughs> that's okay. Um, but you know, that, that kind of relationship is worth building. So if you do meet entertainment lawyers, get a card. Follow up, you know, at some point you may need them, their help. Um, and it's definitely worth, if you're not sure about a contract, get someone to look at it um, because you don't want to sign something and then regret it later and never reassign copyright. Copyright belongs to you, don't reassign it without getting a lawyer to look at the document because as soon as you reassign copyright, no one has to pay you anything ever again. So it really does matter. Um, so please be careful with that. Um, and like I said, manage is a long-term planning. Um, and they're not usually contract negotiations, but some management companies have an in-house agent who'll do that as well. Um, so that can be really worth the money. All right, so we can move on. So the first person you need to attach to your script is a producer. Now, I think a lot of people have a sort of vague understanding of what producers do. Does anyone know, think they know what a producer does? Yeah. Um, depending on whether they're financing themselves or not, they pull together the money and they organize the actual yeah. Uh, Pre-production. Yeah, that's exactly right. They do a lot of the behind the scenes. A lot of people think of directors as being the ones who make a film, but actually, if we go to the next one, um, this is what they do. A producer initiates, coordinates, supervises, and controls all aspects of the motion picture process, including creative, financial, technological, and administrative. They're involved through all phases. They hire the writer. They option the script. They hire the director and attach talent. They raise money and then they give it to you. The person that we work for when we're working as screenwriters is the producer. They are our boss, they sign our paychecks. So the relationship you need to build is with a producer. Directors come and go, and especially in television. Um, directors are guns for hire. They come in, they do an episode or two, and then off they go to work on something else. It is the producer who is always there. And in fact, in television, most of the producers are also writers. So we have a very important relationship with them and we often become producers. So it's really worth um, researching your favorite films, your favorite shows, who produced them. That's gonna really matter to your career. The next one. The best place to find contact info for producers is IMDb Pro. Now IMDb is accessible for everyone, it's free. IMDb Pro costs a little bit, 
There is a 30-day free trial, um, and then it's $20 a month. Um, it, I think it's worth every cent. Um, and, you know, you, off the record, you can sort of share your IMDb Pro <laughs> um, uh, password with a friend and not get in trouble. At least that's been my experience. Um, but what's great about it is that it gives you contact information, and it tells you what people have in development as well as what they have actually produced. And then, so that gives you a really good idea of where a producer is going next, what a production company is up to now. Um, so that's extremely helpful. I, I use IMDb Pro and LinkedIn together every time I do any research on the industry. So those two uh, websites, LinkedIn tells you who is working at a company um, and what their background is, and IMDb Pro helps you get in touch with them. So together, those two programs are just so helpful. Um, so first of all, before you contact a producer, you should always do, con do some research on their work. What have they done before? What are they up to now? Um, all of that kind of thing. And then you need to write a query. Now, this is a tricky thing. I actually teach query writing at VFS. Uh, I have a class called Career Launch, and this is one of the pieces of homework. Uh, and you would think writing an email. I can write an email. I'm a writer. Um, a query is a tricky thing. It's got to be short, and it's got to be sparklingly uh, good in terms of the writing style. It's going to give them an idea of what kind of writer you are. Um, and it has to be short. It's like writing a haiku, a good query. Uh, it really has to reflect who you are and give them a little bit of a sense of why they should uh, respond or why they should want to read something of yours. So if you're a comedy writer, your query has to be funny. Laugh out loud funny. Uh, and you need to give a little bit of, you know, think about the, the classics of rhetoric. You know, uh, you're going to give logos, you're going to give ethos, you're going to give pathos, you're going to give why should, you know, why, what are my credentials for being a good screenwriter? Well, I have a degree in writing or I've written three novels or whatever it is that proves that you're a good writer. Um, what do you have to offer me right now? You know, I've written a fantastic TV pilot. I think you would like it because it has a similar tone to this other wonderful project that you did, something like that. And, you know, call to action doesn't hurt. Uh, you know, please, may I follow up by sending you a copy? Never attach anything to an email, ever. People hate it, uh, and they will instantly bin it without even reading what's in the email because they don't want to have viruses and they don't want to be some things they didn't ask for. So you're always going to ask permission. Please, may I send you my pilot? Please, could I send you a one sheet? Uh, the word please is really important. The younger generation tends to skip it, uh, but most of the people on the receiving end of these emails are my generation or older. Uh, so you've got to say please. Um, and introduce yourself well. You know, you, you have this chance. Don't blow it. Uh, so think about what makes you appealing. Why are they going to want to hear from you? What do you have to offer them? Because these are busy people. They're in the middle of production usually, and they don't have a lot of time to sit around reading emails. Uh, so keep it short, keep it pithy. Tell them why. Why should they bother reading your work? How is it going to benefit them? Um, and if they don't email you back, don't take it personally. Wait two weeks and email them again. Hey, I emailed you a couple of weeks ago. Just wanted to give you a nudge because I really think you'd love my pilot script. Um, and then wait, do it again. You can email six times and then leave it, move on to the next person. But it's amazing what a bit of polite persistence will do when it comes to this. People may have been in production when you contacted them the first time and the second time and the third time. And now suddenly they've come up to forever and they're reading their emails. So you want to be polite. Don't get increasingly mad. Don't take it personally. These are busy people. If they were not busy, you would not want to contact them. So don't take it personally. All right. Uh, so yeah, if they offer you an option contract, it's going to be a little back and forth first, right? People tend to like to get to know each other. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah, about the email thing. Yeah. Uh, basically, on the same email, it should be follow up like no, fresh new, fresh new email, but remind them, I emailed you a couple of weeks ago, and I was, just I was just talking about my pilot script, which I really think you'd love, and then remind them what the pilot script was about. So that part of it can be the same, but the intro should be different. And, you know, it's, it's a tricky thing. You want to keep the tone really positive. Uh, even though you're feeling a bit bruised because they didn't email you back, you cannot reflect that. Um, some people prefer to be phoned. Agents particularly like the phone. And I know, again, a lot of young people do not like the phone, um, but you know, you've got to think about what's, what their preference is. So sometimes it can be just good to call and have a script in front of you. Think about telemarketers who always do that. It's horrible, I know. Um, but there are things you want to get, a, get across. 
who am I? What have I got to offer you? Why am I phoning you? Specifically, why you? And you would always preface this kind of email or this kind of phone call with a person's name. Uh, it's amazing how many terrible, uh, terribly educated young writers to whom it may concern, dear sir, madam, and they send out blast emails to like 10 different agents at once. Do not do that. People hate it. It's awful. Um, but if they offer you an option contract because they like your script, um, in fact, I'll first of all maybe talk about what an option agreement is. So maybe the next one, uh, this is kind of don't burn your bridges, that kind of thing. Here we go. So an option agreement is like, you know when you were a kid and your parents were getting into the car and you would call like dibs on the front seat? Uh, that's what an option agreement is. It's a producer calling dibs on your project. They don't want anyone else to make it. They just want to see whether they can put it together before they buy it. So they are giving you a little bit of money just to put it on hold. And usually there's a time frame attached to this. It might be six months, it might be two years. Um, and they will give you a certain amount of money. You also have the, a chance to maybe renew that if it takes a bit longer. Because in Canada, it can take four years to get a project together before you start production. Los Angeles tends to be a little bit quicker. Um, but you want to make sure when you're negotiating an option agreement that you have seen another option agreement so that you know what should be there. And again, that book by Mark Litwack is a gold mine for this. They've got examples of, of the option agreements. You can sometimes find some online as well, or you could contact me and I'll send you one. Um, and it just gives you a bit of information. It, it, uh, an option agreement should pre-negotiate how much they will pay you if they make your film or how much they will pay you if your show goes into production. So it really is the most important contract you will ever have even though it seems like small potatoes because it's just six months and it's just temporary, it actually should outline everything that will ever matter to you with regards to your project. So for example, if you want merchandise rights for your children's series, it should be in the option agreement, right? If you want to sell toys and you want a piece of that action, that should be in the option agreement. Um, if you want the right to do a sequel and you would like to have first right of refusal to write that sequel, well, that should be in the option agreement. Any information that really matters to the future of your project should be there. So even though it's a sort of fairly short one or two page document often, um, what's in it really matters. So do be cautious about negotiating this. If you have concerns about your ability to carefully read a contract, hire a lawyer. Right? It's worth it. Even though you may pay everything that they give you, to pay, uh, at least you will still have rights in your own project. All right, let's move on. Uh, this is, again, an example of a television series that one of my former students wrote. Um, to get started writing for TV, you're going to need samples. This is the number one mistake that people make. They're like, oh, well, I just started writing my first TV pilot. Take me on as a client. And the agent's like, no. Or I've just started writing my first TV pilot. I want to work on your show. No, <laughs> they don't want that. They want samples. So they, they want at least two original TV pilot scripts. And they want one spec script, which is a, a sample of an existing show. So if you were going to do that kind of sample spec script right now, you, I would write Star Trek Next Gen, uh, what is it called? Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Everybody knows who, uh, who Spock is and who Uhura are. You could write that and everyone would go, oh, they can capture those voices. They can write in a different style. Excellent. That's what we want. Because in television, you have to be a bit of a chameleon. You have to be able to write in your own style with your own kind of feisty, whatever it is that you've got, your special quality, but you also have to be able to emulate somebody else's style. So that's really important. So that spec script proves this. Um, there are lots of things you could, you could do. If you're like a darker writer, um, you could do a series like, well, I guess you couldn't, there's a couple that just got canceled which, uh, or ended, uh, which would have been really good for that. But you would want something quite dark like, um, um, what have we been using? We've been using Mandalorian, Abbott Elementary for comedy, and 911 for one hour drama, that kind of thing. So things which are, have some longevity, they're going to be on the air for a while, and you would write a sample episode of that series. Um, a good place to go and look for, you know, um, sort of good choices for this is the Nickelodeon Writing Fellowship. They actually have a list of things that they would allow you to submit specs for. So it gives you a good example of what's out there that you could write for. Um, and then the other samples might be something like a feature film script or a play. 
sometimes people will look at that. I actually got a job on a television series um, because I had all my samples. I had a pile like that. And I was sitting opposite a showrunner trying to persuade him to give me a job. And he was looking at my samples and I was looking at him look at my samples and he did not want to read my samples. I knew that, he was a busy man. And so he was looking at me and he was like, oh. uh, and I was like, look, I could show you a short film that I made. I wrote it and I produced it and it's eight minutes long. And he clutched at it like a drowning man. Yes, I'll watch your eight minute short film so that I don't have to read that gigantic pile of samples. And I showed him, a, it was a really low budget short film. It was incredibly cheesy. At one point there was a plastic mouse with a bit of ketchup on it, low budget, um, but it was funny. And he hired me to write an episode of his television series based on the funniness of my eight minute short film. So samples can be anything, but uh, you know, it helped that I had the other samples, of course. Um, but yeah, that was the one that proved that I was funny. Two of our grads who are on this program, When Calls the Heart, um, they both got in in the same way. Uh, someone phoned me and said, Kat, we need a writing assistant. And in the second case, Kat, we need a, a script coordinator. Uh, and I recommended someone who had just graduated. Um, they both earned that recommendation by kind of getting out there and getting office PA jobs and producer's assistant jobs, that kind of thing first. Um, and then they both parlayed that writing assistant job and that script coordinator job into a writing room job. And now they're both writing television for a living. Um, so it's always that's sort of a good example of a pathway to television. And I'll talk about the hierarchy in television in just a minute. So um, yeah, do consider though, if you've never written for television before, do consider a writing program. Obviously I'm biased towards VFS. I've taught there for 20 years. I'm the head of the writing department. I'm totally biased. Um, I will say though, if you do a different program, just make sure they teach long form, right? So UBC is great. I'm a UBC alumni. I love UBC, but they only teach short unless you're doing a master's program and then you do you write one pilot. Um, Capilano I've taught at, short form. Emily Carr I've taught at, short form. LaSalle I've taught at, short form. The only school apart from VFS that teaches long form in Vancouver is Langara. They have a new program that's like eight months long. Um, I don't know how good it is I, because it's so new, uh, but they are the competition. Um, but you know, that's fine. Uh, do make sure though that you go into a program that's gonna let you graduate with the samples you need to build a career. Because it, one year, it's a, it's a lot of money. So you got to you try and make sure that you're getting something good out of it. You don't have to do a one-year program first. There are stepping stones that you can do. I think the next one, if you go next after this. Yeah, there's some really good training programs which are shorter, but you have to be very, very good to get into them. Um, in Canada, the Canadian Film Center has something called the Prime Time Television Program. It's a great program, um, but it's really competitive. Uh, and uh, the Pacific Screenwriting Program in Vancouver is incredible. It's a great stepping stone for television writers. They have a professional showrunner. They put together a writer's room. And if you can get into that uh, writer's room, it's not necessarily going to be made, but then they will introduce you to agents and all of those, uh, all of those people get internships on existing proper real television shows. And, and many of them, about half maybe, end up working as writers in writing rooms within two years. So it's a fantastic program. Um, in America, you would want the ABC Disney Fellowship, the Nickelodeon Writers Fellowship. HBO used to have one and might have one again. Uh, there's a few others. Fellowships are usually lowly paid, uh, but you know, mentorships for six months to a year, but they're highly prestigious and will open doors for you. So you do want to think about that. Um, Canadian Film Center and Pacific Screenwriting Program don't pay you, um, but they are scholarships. So you, know, you have to live, but that's it. Uh, but yeah, like I said, Movie Bites. This is the website that I recommended, moviebites.com. It's a really good place to find fellowships as well as screenwriting competitions. So go and have a look there. A lot of times though, people will take a one-year screenwriting program and then they will do this kind of fellowship because the one-year screenwriting program gets them ready and they have the samples. So to get into Pacific Screenwriting Program, you would need two TV pilots. Uh, so you need to have that material ready to go. Uh, okay, next one. Um, tax credits do determine who gets hired where. You really, in BC, and it's for good reason, uh, if you were living and working in BC, there's an advantage because if they hire you, they get tax credits, the producer does. So they basically get, I don't know, I think it's 35% back on every dollar they spend on you, uh, which is really good. It means that people are incentivized to hire local. 
what that does mean, though, is if you want to get a job on transplant, which is based in Ontario, uh, anyone from Ontario will have an advantage over you. So it's a really can be a tricky thing. Um, but, you know, it makes it tricky for people from outside of BC to work here sometimes. Um, and this is true of crew as well and cast. Uh, no matter where you live, start watching shows written and produced in your area. Uh, so, you know, we only have between two and a half and four shows made and written here at any given time. Um, last year, I think it was Family Law and When Calls the Heart um, and The Imperfects, but The Imperfects got canceled. Family Law is on pause, don't know what's gonna happen. There's a new show coming called Allegiance, uh, which is being written right now. Um, and there's a couple more coming. So you need to do research, find out what is here, uh, what you could write for, um, and then you know, try and write a sample that would be a good sample for that. So if it's a sci-fi series, you would write for a different sci-fi series so that you've got a sample. So they can go, oh, I see this person could write sci-fi. Excellent. And they might give you a job. Uh, all right, next one up. So this is the hierarchy I was talking about before. Uh, hierarchy is really important in television. Um, think about a television writing room, like a captain uh, with a crew on a ship, right? The producer of the show or the studio is the owner of the ship, uh, but the showrunner is the ca captain. The showrunner hires and fires everyone. The showrunner is ultimately the voice of the show. So people like Ryan Murphy, Shonda Rhimes, Shonda Rhimes is um, Scandal, Bridgerton, uh, Grey's Anatomy, things like that. Uh, Ryan Murphy is things like Glee, um, Hollywood, um, something recent. Oh, American Horror Story, things like that. Um, in Canada, we have people like Dennis Heaton is a famous showrunner here. You probably never heard of Dennis Heaton, but he was the showrunner for Motive, um, and then The Imperfects and The Order. Um, or Simon Barry, who was the showrunner for Continuum and, uh, oh my goodness, Worry and None most recently. Um, so they are the people that can hire you in television. So they, you have to get to know them, get to know their work. If you can get to know them personally, that's good too. Um, and so this is, most people come in on this side as an office PA, as a producer's assistant, as a showrunner's assistant, as a script coordinator, uh, that kind of job. And they don't pay particularly well, you know, it's not ideal. I'm going to give you a, a, a money handout before you leave today so you know exactly how much people make, uh, because I think people are too secretive about money and they should not be. Um, so uh, the, the, the plum job that every up and coming writer wants is that job, writer's assistant. Uh, you might think to yourself, why do I want a job as an assistant? That sounds terrible. No, the writing assistant is a great job. You get to be in the writer's room. Yeah, they'll send you for coffee and you'll have to pick up the lunch, but you get to be in the writer's room. You get to be there when people are pitching stories. You get to be there when they're breaking episodes. If everyone's run out of ideas, they'll go, how about you? Do you have any ideas? And you can pitch something. And if you're good in the room and they like you, you'll get your first shared credit in the first season. And that would be a shared credit with the showrunner. So you would write an episode and then they would rewrite it to make sure that it's good enough and in the voice of the show. So it's the entry level door. Everyone wants that job. If you get that job, it means you are up against people from Harvard. You know, it is a plum job. It's a very difficult job to get. It's extremely desirable and it pays terribly. Um, but it is the entry level job to getting television work. And the job above that, sometimes they skip junior writer and go straight to staff writer. That's a proper writing job. You'll get a salary plus credits and you'll, you get paid per episode that you write as well. So you're suddenly then you're making condo money, right? Now suddenly you've got a condo in Vancouver because you are a staff writer. Story editors rewrite other people's work as well as writing their own scripts. Um, producers are writers and they're the producer on set. So there's always a representative of the writer's room on set as a producer. And so they have to understand how the rest of things work. How, how do we cast? How do we hire and fire? How does post-production work? You know, and they are there sitting in a director's chair next to the director and making sure that this, uh, you know, this director for hire hasn't come in and changed everything and messed up what we planned for the end of the season. So it's a very, uh, television is a very production focused job. You are writing, but you are also a producer. Um, and so you make money for that too. So if you're at that stage where you're a producer, you're making a writer's fee, you're making a producer's fee, you're making you know, money per episode, um, and you're getting a story editing fee as well. And suddenly now you're owning a house in Vancouver. That's where you are financially. 
Um, and then as you move up, become executive producer and showrunner, uh, you're making good money. And now you're sort of, uh, you know, Canada, maybe not, but in America, you've got a mansion. Um, but uh, in Canada, you might have a nice house now. Suddenly you're maybe west side instead of east side of Vancouver, something like that. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's an interesting job. It's, you know, you could have that job and be riding high and then the next minute you're unemployed because the show gets canceled. There is no security, uh, none of that. Writing is not that kind of business. We are, you know, independent contractors and we hope for the next contract. Um, but, you know, it is a fantastic job and very fun, super creative, and you work with fantastic people. Um, now, getting started, uh, you, by the time you hear about a show being staffed, it's too late and the writer's room is already assembled. That is why you need an agent because they will hear about it first and they will say, hey, do you want me to put you up for Sullivan's Crossing? Or hey, how about we suggest you for Allegiance? And then you're like, yeah, put my stuff in there. And they will send your work over. They'll take a look at it. They'll go, oh yeah, that sounds good. Or now we have someone already like that. We've, you know, we're trying to build a room out of disparate different people. Um, and, and they'll give you a chance to maybe come in if they haven't met you already, that kind of thing. Move on. And yeah, so television festivals and markets, let's say you want to pitch an original show. Uh, Fox and I were talking earlier about pitching original shows. Um, by doing, by going to somewhere like Banff World Media Festival, Content London, in France, there's a, a, a market called Series Mania in Lille. Um, there are all over the world, there are these kinds of festivals and you pay a significant amount of money to go and pitch original shows. And it gives you access to network executives, studio heads, things like that. Uh, it's very fun, uh, very enjoyable and quite pricey. Um, there is a thing through Con uh, Creative PC or Passport to Markets where if they say yes to you, they will pay half uh, for you to go to these things. Uh, I recommend them, I think they're fantastic. You probably won't sell a show your first or even second time there, but you'll make relationships. And those are the relationships that eventually will make someone feel confident enough to hire you um, as a showrunner and to develop your, your show. Um, yeah, so Nat P in LA, things like that. Uh, so yeah, we can move on. Um, yeah, and there are sometimes free freebie things that you can apply for. So diversity of voices is a good one. I took part in a program called Banff Spark, which was for women. Sometimes they'll have, uh, you know, a writing room internship through that. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a great thing. They're very enjoyable. Um, you've got to practice your pitching. It's quite nerve wracking. It's just a really, really fun, and especially if you're gregarious. Uh, I'm quite outgoing, so I like it. The introverts struggle a bit, uh, but it's okay. You know, you can have a video pitch, um, you know, just sit there and let it unfold. Uh, so there's different ways of doing it. Uh, all right, next one. So features, let's talk about feature films. Um, to get started selling feature film scripts, consider starting out in the TV movie market. I'm going to suggest this especially right now because it's very difficult to get a theatrical feature in, in cinemas. I mean, you know, it used to be different. There used to be these wonderful independent films that would show in movie theaters, and now it's all Marvel all the time. Um, you know, it's tricky to get something that's not a, an action movie with superheroes into a cinema. Um, and television movies are improving. Um, you know, they're not kind of these, you know, kind of ups. Yeah, no, yeah, even homework is getting better. Like one of my former students, uh, in fact, there's, in a few minutes, you'll see a slide, uh, wrote the first lesbian Hallmark love story. Um, she's an excellent writer. She also worked for Bluff City Law, The Bold Type, all these great American shows. Um, so the, you know, the quality is really going up. Same thing with the, um, with the thrillers, you know, these lifetime movies used to be, you know, no, some of them are getting better as well. And also it's a, it's a stepping stone. Like one of, one of a, a VFS grad called Craig Wenman, he comes in as a guest speaker all the time. He was doing a lot of rear window. You remember the Alfred Hitchcock film, Rear Window? So he was doing, you know, people move into a house and then the killer moves in next door, right? Like that. And he did maybe six of those. And then he did murder mysteries, that kind of stuff. And now he's doing theatrical features. His last feature is called Bandit, uh, and it's Mel Gibson, Josh Duchamel, and I can't remember the female lead's name. Um, and uh, he's doing really well. Like he's really, you know, he's got 41 produced credits. And he started off with super low budget ripoffs of Rear Window for a TV movie market, right? It's a, it's a stepping stone. You've got to think about it like, how am I going to get where I want to be? And TV movies are a good way to get there. You also don't have to be a union member. They don't pay particularly well. And again, my handout will tell you exactly how low they pay, um, but it's a good way in. 
there's an excellent book. Actually, if you go back one, just one slide. Uh, for, yeah, one bit, there we go. Uh, that book, Writing a TV Movie, um, Rosalind is actually here at Word Vancouver. Um, and that book is excellent. I've read it. It's really good. It took me a day to read or something like that. But I've gone back to it again and again because the structure section is so informative. It's a real nuts and bolts, very useful book for someone writing a TV movie for the first time. Highly recommend. Uh, yeah, definitely get a copy of that book, even if you can't see Rosalind talk. Maybe do both, but um, yeah, highly recommend. Uh, that's Love Classified. Remember I told you about the lesbian love story? You know, it used to be that people knew what a Hallmark movie was. It was predictable, it was trite, it had the same plot, big city girls, small town, blah, blah, blah. Uh, It's not anymore, it's changed. They have a new executive, apart from anything else, who is a middle-aged black woman. Uh, it's very different and it's going to become even more different. So if you are thinking about writing any kind of love story, I'm just gonna say, you know, it's also Hallmark is not the only company making love stories. There are other companies as well. Um, so I would, I would consider that 33 of them in Vancouver every year, every year, right? By far the most number of feature length of anything. So it's definitely worth pursuing. Um, so again, if you want to write for features, you're going to need samples. So you need at least two original feature length scripts, maybe a TV movie or an MOW and other samples. When you're starting out in TV movie, they often want to see the first draft of a feature film. They just don't want to hear a pitch and then pay you. They want you to write it and then they'll think about buying it. And there's very few rewrites, so make it as good as it can be because they usually pay for one rewrite, that's it. If you're ever wondering why they're not that good, one rewrite, that's it. So you really have to you know, try and get it as good as you can on your own before you go into a producer. Uh, let's move on. Um, if you want to attach a producer to one of your projects, InkTip is excellent. Actually, it was Craig Winman that turned me onto that site. He sold his first six screenplays on that site. I was like skeptical always. Um, so I actually put in a historical drama that I considered unsaleable that I wrote. <laughs> Four people off adoption it. I was quite impressed. Uh, so that was good. Um, it's you know $32 a month, something like that. For the first month, you can get cheaper. Um, there are cheaper options though, so if you go to the next one. Blacklist is about the same price, but Script Revolution is free. And I was, again, skeptical, free, how can that be good? Uh, so I put a call out to all of my former students. Has anyone sold a screenplay on Script Revolution? Yes, 2020, one of my students sold a script in Script Revolution and it didn't cost a cent. So I'm gonna say, that seems good. Uh, give that a go, why not? Um, the other ones, uh, the other way you can do it is become a producer yourself. You can make films, there's nothing to stop you. There's no rule that says you have to have gone to school to be a producer. You can just start making them. The first two sets that I was ever on, I was the producer. I'd never been on a set before, and I just decided to make films. I, admittedly, they were both terrible, but I learned, you know, and that's how you do it. You, you make short films, you learn, then you make a longer form, you make a feature, you make a low budget. Uh, my husband and I made a feature in 2017. Uh, we shot most of it in our house. The cost of the entire feature film, including lawyers' fees and post-production, 25 grand. You know, it, I mean, we had pulled in a lot of favors, but still, uh, that's pretty cheap. Most features cost half a million uh, minimum, right? And then up from there. But you can apply for funding, Telefilm Canada, Creative BC, Canada Council, BC Arts Council. There's lots of great funding agencies, especially in Canada, uh, that are trying to keep our industry alive by helping independent people make films. So do please look for those. I've got a good funding calendar. If anyone wants to reach out to me, I'll send it your way. Happy to do it. Let's move on. I'm going to run out of time because I've got video games at the end. <laughs> um, so keep going. Yeah, that was written by one of my friends. In fact, one of my former students wrote Organ Trail, and she sold it by putting the log line on Twitter. <gasps> I love that. So impressive. Um, yeah, so Telephone Canada has a low budget fund. They consider low budget 250000 to 350000 uh, But uh, it does have a development phase, which pays writers. Uh, but they require the producer to have made a film in the last six years. So if you are looking for a producer, try and find someone who's made a film in the last six years because that makes them eligible to raise money for development. Right? That should be your, your bar, is that. Uh, okay, move on. Uh, sorry, back one. Self-financing. Let's go back one. No, no worries. Uh, back again. And back one more. There we go. Oh, forward one. <laughs> 
Uh, there we go. Um, it is difficult to find proper distribution for a self-made film, right? That's the tricky part of this. Everyone thinks, oh, I can just get it on Netflix. No, you can't. Uh, it's very difficult. And you have to make sure the quality is good enough for Netflix. They require a certain, a certain caliber of camera, for example. Um, so you do have to be a little bit careful about that. Just because you made it cheaply doesn't mean you'll make a profit. The most important element of making a film yourself is having a star in it. Someone who is a big enough name that someone will want to buy it. So spend money. If you're going to spend money anywhere, spend it on one star. Anything like that would be, you know, will make the difference. Um, all right, let's go forward. Moviebytes.com. Here I go recommending it again. Coverfly is also good. Helps you keep track of the competitions you've entered. And again, these screenwriting competitions, the most prestigious ones would be Nickel Fellowship. That's run by the Oscars. Uh, Sundance Film uh, Program, it's called Labs. And Page International is a really good one. I like Page International because they divide it by genre. So it's a good way for producers to come and find you. Uh, so that's good. All right, next one. Video games. This is the shortest one. It's also sort of the, the most complicated in a way. Um, although, I don't know. Um, so again, I think that you would be wise to take a course in video game writing. Again, I'm biased VFS. There are not many schools that have video game writing classes. UBC does, and I know because I stole one of their instructors. Uh, so they do. If you're taking a degree already at UBC, you can be in a video game writing class there. Um, but, and then there's VFS, and I don't know of any others. There may be some that I just don't know about. Um, but if you're thinking about writing for video games, this is a good career. I mean, if you're thinking financially, this is the one. Junior, a junior narrative designer is making between 65 and 75,000 US a year. And it's a salaried position. A senior narrative designer is making over $100,000 a year a US. And it's a salaried position. If you're a good writer and you love video games, this is a good job. You know, and I know parents tend to think, oh, <laughs> that seems, you know, childish or something. Uh, it is a serious job, and, and, and there are ways of getting into it. So game jams, uh, if you hear, sorry, go back from. Uh, game jams are a way of teaming up um, and building super simple small games as a team, and then you show them and play them in a kind of group environment, and then somebody wins. Game jams are a good way of building a team and showing your talent. So if anyone's thinking, well, how do I start? You know, I already write what I consider to be really good scripts of Video games, how do I take the next step? Game jams would be a good one. There's also a thing coming up called Creative Campfire. Um, and it's run by a guy called Arthur Patricio. I, I just hired him as a mentor at VFS because he's a killer. He's a Brazilian. Uh, he did the video game writing for Cobra Kai 1 and 2. Uh, really smart guy. He looks about 12, but I think he's like 32 or something like that. Um, but he's created this thing called Creative Campfire. It's all about writing video games. Um, and collaborating with, you know, with game designers. Uh, so I highly recommend that. The best place to find job listings for video game writing is LinkedIn. LinkedIn seems old school to me, like it's the best place on, to put your resume online, but it's also the place that people hire video game writers. Uh, surprisingly so. I've had lots of guest speakers come in from video game uh, companies and also narrative designers. Um, and they have all agreed that most of them got their jobs, or if they're going to post a job, they do it at LinkedIn. So make sure that your LinkedIn profile is up to date. The banner behind your head on LinkedIn belongs to you as well. So if you've worked on a game or if you have an image that reflects who you are, put that on your LinkedIn profile as well. Anything you've done, any awards you've won, if you want a game jam, if you went to Creative Campfire, or anything like that, pop that on there too. And uh, yeah. Most people start as that was written by one of my former students as well, and so was that. Um, and they're just sort of fa it's a fantastic way of making money doing something that you love. If you enjoy video games, which I now really do, and during COVID, I started playing Breath of the Wild, Legend of Zelda. I became completely addicted. I love that game, um, and I'm now a video game fan. Um, and it's one of those things that, you know, if you've never played before, it's never too late to start playing video games. They're very enjoyable. I was like, am I going to get dexterous enough with the hat? Yes, yes, I am. I may not be as great as someone who's 20, but that's OK. Uh, very enjoyable. Um, and they, you know, and during COVID, they saved me. Uh, you know, when I couldn't leave the house, it was wonderful. Um, so I have this, look at that timing. It's almost perfect. Uh, so I have these handouts. This is about money. Uh, it's very detailed. 
every single one of these numbers has been checked by at least three people who do this job. Uh, I, I guess I mentioned earlier, extremely skeptical. People lie about money all the time. They either tell you they make less or they tell you they make more. So I always check numbers by somebody else. Um, so this will give you an idea of what people make. And, you know, there are people, oh, hang on, I think I do. Um, people who write, uh, people who write novels, oh, um, uh, people who write novels like urban fantasy novels, series, and thrillers, things like that, they can make excellent money. Um, but literary writers, uh, you know, they want to make more money. Right, they want to make more money. They want something. So maybe children's book writer. That's interesting. Quite well, financially. Yeah. Anyone else need one? Um, what about you, Alex? You want one? Love one. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, so there we are. Anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, you touched on it briefly, but uh, you know, I'm I'm really interested in getting into the industry as someone who's selling yeah. ideas. Oh. And so, uh, you know, I'm I'm a writer. I'm a published author, yeah. but I'm looking to sell my idea for a animated TV series, not be like a Part of the writer's room. See, that's a tricky. What would you recommend yeah. for, for that's a very that? tricky business, actually. I've been in that business recently because I was selling ideas for unscripted shows. Mm -hmm. And it's a very difficult thing to do. People are like, what do you mean you don't want to work on the show? <laughs> um, you can do it in unscripted. Animated is tricky, though, because I've had a few animated writers and animated producers come in and talk, you know, as guest speakers. And they tend to take pictures in house. Mm -hmm. So they are not seeking external pitches from other people. Um, they tend to ask the animators who already work that. Yeah. So it could be tricky. I think, you know, you would have to write a pilot for that. Yeah. And then you would have to win some kind of competition. And at that point, when you prove that it has worth and value, you might do it. Having said that, you said that you were writing yourself. What sort of things do you write normally? Uh, well, I've published a nonfiction book. I've just finished writing a children's chapter. I've oh. written, like, no, no, that's very good. Like while, so no, lot. I love that. And I've written the, the pilot. Uh, I'm yeah. supervising it now. Well, so I'm looking to like have take the creative idea I have, the yeah. rule that I've made for it, but then um, you know get the right people involved and then staff a room that way to, to yeah, yeah. still have that creative. Connection. It's a tricky thing. Like I said, they usually take mm -hmm. take pictures in house. What people do want though is um, is IP uh, and what they're talking about is intellectual property. Yeah. So if you publish this as a chapter book and then your agent reached out and said, we have this chapter book, um, you know, is there any chance you, that you might want to pitch this as a television series? And you would already have proved that there was a market for it. The chapter book success would be something that you can then parlay into a credible pitch. So th that would be generally more appealing than, than a pilot script and a pitch. But it's, it's worth reaching out to animation companies. You never know. We maybe have time for one more question. Yeah. If you're a writer who's been doing novels and short stories, primarily novels, yeah. and you want to switch to screenwriting, what would be the best path in? I mean, so far it looks like maybe a TV movie. Yeah. I would say TV movie. Um, but you know, you could write a pilot script for a TV series. Uh, TV series are hard to get off the ground, though. You know, you'd be more likely to have a produced credit more quickly if you were a TV movie. So I would say go there. Are you? Can you write mysteries, that kind of thing, or thrillers? Uh, well, or? I generally write science fiction and fantasy. So oh, tricky. Weird stuff, but yeah. I'm also a mom too, and I freelance from home. Yeah. Something like getting in the ground floor of a writer's room. That would be hard. Uh, it it would be tougher to yeah. manage. And people do manage it. Around. It's hard to break. In when you when you have kids, but if you already have kids when you've broken in, you can do that. There's a couple of really wonderful TV writers in, in Vancouver who have to work, but um, there used to be sci-fi used to do science fiction TV movies. I don't know if they you know if that will happen again. I, you know, again, I would if I were you, I would write a script and then enter a competition, try and get your name out there associated with that genre. What about? I mean, would it be a good idea to? Say yeah. Start there. yeah, I think that sounds like a great idea. Do that. Yeah. Very well done. Thank you so much. It was so
Thank you very much. Take care. Bye.